Passover, the crown jewel of biblical feasts, sacred to Jews and Christians alike, taught since the Exodus 35 centuries ago, and revered in the Lord's Supper, Communion, the Eucharist, and by all peoples who respect the freedom of nations. Here is Passover in all its glory. Shalom. Hello again. Why am I all dressed up like this? It's Passover, the crown jewel of Jewish festivals, the first one God gave Moses on Mount Sinai after the Exodus, uh, done every year for 35 centuries and uh, comes down to us in, in beautiful form and teaches us a great deal about the Messiah. We have a studio audience today to watch me do this, and we're going to go to the studio where we have set up an authentic Passover table. And here it is. Well, the table beside me has been set this way for 3,500 years. That's on a scale where our country is a little over 200 years old. Passover is far and away the world's oldest festival. It's the first of the feasts that God gave Moses on Mount Sinai, and it has been celebrated all that time through those millennia, through the the Inquisitions, the Crusades, the concentration camps, everywhere the Jews were, Passover was always celebrated. It's interesting when we look back to the slavery in Egypt because there was 400 years of silence during that slavery. And uh, in that time, God said nothing to his people. But at the end of it, there was a sudden blood sacrifice, the lamb uh, of Egypt. And, and he emancipated the entire nation in a single night, a dramatic uh, event. Then uh, scripture came out, and prophets uh, preached, and kings uh, uh, ruled, and finally there was 400 more years of silence after the Old Testament, leading up to another great blood sacrifice, the coming of the Messiah. That, that should really have been a very great hint to Israel. When John the Baptist saw Jesus coming, he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. So after another 400 year silence, the blood sacrifice of the lamb again, whichever testament I read, old or new, I can say the blood of the lamb delivers me from bondage. Well, uh, why do we do this Passover? Why do we go through the whole ceremony? What, why is this worth knowing? Well, for one thing, the Lord did this on his last earthly night. There's a lot of things you might do uh, tonight if you were going on trial for your life in the morning. This is what he chose to do. He felt this feast was very important. Uh, secondly, uh, he said at the table, do this in remembrance of me, particularly in reference to the cup and, and the bread that he served his disciples. And so we still do in, in the Lord's Supper, in communion, in the Eucharist. Uh, we uh, uh, all do it. And, and of course, in Passover, uh, unknowingly, the Jews take the wine and the bread just the same. Uh, so the Lord said to do it, and we do it, but we should once in a while, look at the whole feast and see how this bread and wine comes out of the, the normal uh, procedure of the feast. And then the Lord, when he put down his cup, said, I'll not drink of this wine until I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. That, that expression, this wine, a zahain, it's a special glass of wine because wine for Passover is different than for the year round. So he implied that we will be doing Passover in the kingdom to come. So if we're going to do this feast, we might run through it once here and we'll be more ready. Right. Now, when, uh, when we prepare for the kingdom, we, we have a lot of festivals in mind, but this one is the crown jewel. This was the first. It's on the first full moon of spring. It's uh, something that is uh, going to be quite a thrill when we go there. But we should know we can't just set up a table and start into Passover. The gospel speaks of a whole day of preparation. Several things have to be done. For one thing, in the Jewish household, you have to change over all of the dishes. Uh, you can't use year-round dishes on Passover. Now, the Orthodox Jewish woman, really keeping the law, has four sets of dishes going because you have to separate milk and meat the year-round. A dish that held a hamburger can never hold ice cream in its career. Uh, one is forever milk and one is forever meat, and that is their tradition. And so there are two sets of dishes going all the time. But then on Passover, they've got to wash up those two sets and pots and pans and silver and glassware and everything and put it all away, lock it up 
for the eight-day festival and bring out the Passover setup. That's uh, two more sets of dishes and pots and pans and glassware and silver and so on. And all that, of course, has to be washed up, hasn't been used for a year, and set out. So there's a, it's a day of dishwashing, tell you the truth. <laughs> And uh, when the Passover things come out, it's the most splendid things. Every, every woman is proud of her Passover setup, and, and uh, it's, it's a chance to use your wedding presents and the things you never use, uh, the finest stuff that, that she has. Then when the dishes have all been changed over, uh, we purge the leaven out of the kitchen. We get the bread crumbs and the cookie crumbs and the Twinkie wrappers and everything out of there, clean the breadboard with a toothpick, because leaven in the Bible is sin. Uh, 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Paul said, Purge out the old leaven and become a new lump, for Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. When they ate the unleavened bread in the Exodus, it was uh, a way of being deliverable. <laughs> they, they ate pure bread and they became pure. And so we get the leaven out of the house. They make a game out of it. They put uh, crumbs of leaven on the bookcases and the furniture, and they send the little children out to look for it. And when they find some of the crumbs of leaven, they call Father, and he comes with a feather and a wooden spoon, and he brushes some of the crumbs of leaven into the spoon with the feather, takes them to the fireplace, throws them in the fire. And so the, the little children see the judgment of sins, all those little crumbs of little sins, and they're all burned up to be ready uh, for Passover. It also gets the Father and the children out of the kitchen during all this dishwashing. <laughs> okay. And, uh, then uh, uh, the third thing we do is uh, Father dons this kittle, this robe, uh, a white robe, which is the robe of the ordinary priest in the tabernacle. Uh, the, the robe that he wore as he continued to sacrifice. His hands were always in the blood so he could wear pure white. Otherwise, robes have to be sewn with red, uh, blue, purple, the colors of the Lord. But pure white denotes ongoing righteousness, perfect righteousness. Uh, this is what we'll wear when we marry the Lord. The Revelation 19, 7 and 8, Blessed is he who comes to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Uh, the wife of Christ hath made herself ready, and unto her was appointed fine linen, clean and white, which is the righteousness of saints. So behold your wedding dress. We'll all wear this when we marry the Lord. Father puts it on to bring some of the temple home. Uh, Passover is a home holiday. Uh, Yom Kippur or Rosh Hashanah, the high festivals in the fall, are a synagogue holidays. Rather like in Christianity, maybe we think of Christmas or Thanksgiving, uh, that sort of holiday as a home gathering. But Easter is the time you get to church and you see the people you haven't seen since the last Easter. Uh, that's a church holiday. So Father brings a little of his church home, so to say. He brings a tabernacle robe into the house and a mitre and wears the costume of the tabernacle. This is a 35 century old costume, imagine. And all robes of all churches, all synagogues originate with this one. Well, uh, finally it's time to get to the table, it's sundown, and it's time to start the service, and we start it with the lighting of the candles. Now, uh, you may ask uh, uh, why a woman always lights the candles in Judaism, and that's true. Women have no other ritual worship responsibility. They don't sit with the men in the synagogues. Uh, they don't uh, pray. They don't have to pray. They may pray. But their father or brother or son's confessions are, are efficacious for them and so on. But you can't start any service, uh, Sabbath or Passover, without a woman lighting the candles. And we ask why. And the answer, of course, is in the New Testament. When you have an Old Testament question, the answer's in the New, typically. Uh, the Bible is a book with the answers in the back. We can, uh, <laughs> we can uh, remember that a woman brought us the light of the world. Uh, you, you may say, well, we're all <laughs> born of a woman. Uh, God used a, a woman to bring us his son, but aren't we all born of a woman? Not really. Adam and Eve weren't born. God showed that he could make people of either model, set them going. <laughs> they, they were adults. They were never babies. And so he, why didn't he do it with the Lord? I mean, look how the Lord had to grow up in, in Galilee and uh, visited the temple, got in trouble with his family when he got lost, <laughs> discussing the scriptures in the temple when he was 12 years old. Then there's a long silence till he's 30. You know, we wouldn't have missed much if he were uh, made in heaven out of some heavenly stuff and sent down here at 30 years old. But I don't think that would have answered his, his calling. 
He has to be flesh like our flesh in order to be a proper sacrifice for us. Don't you see if the pastor said, walk in the footsteps of Jesus, and he were made in heaven out of some heavenly stuff, there's your excuse. You would say, well, I wasn't made in heaven out of some heavenly stuff. Jesus doesn't really know my problems. We don't have that out. He was born of a woman just as we are, and uh, he did not sin. He won this battle in this equipment. He got tired. He got hungry. He wept. It hurt to be crucified. He was depressed when he heard of Lazarus' death. Uh, he was like us. He was a man with a man's feelings a man's sensitivities. The gospel said he was tempted in all things just as we are, and yet he did not sin. Knowing he was born of a woman tells us he's the adequate sacrifice for us. Now then, a second reason, it was a noticed birth. I mean, let's tell it like it is. Here is, is Mary, a, a girl, we'd say a ninth grade girl. Uh, <laughs> she's nine months pregnant, and she's traveling from uh, Nazareth to Bethlehem, my goodness, uh, down to the Jordan River Valley up to Jerusalem and, and over to Bethlehem is a 75-mile ride, I suppose, on a donkey. And that's not easy. And then she gets to Bethlehem. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever seen Bethlehem, but it's no big deal. Uh, <laughs> Bethlehem's just a crossroads. There was one hotel uh, uh, there then. There's one there now. You can never get a room at the inn. Uh, <laughs> There was no place for her to stay. And so she had her, her baby in a cave. Uh, we make a wooden barn out of this thing when we get it over here, but they don't have wooden buildings in Israel. There's not enough trees for that. It was a cave where the animals were kept. They had a fire at the mouth of the cave to keep predators away. And she had to lay her newborn baby in a manger. My goodness, you wouldn't really want to lay a newborn baby in a manger. You people that grew up in the country know what a manger is. It's where the animals eat. It's a stone trough. It's cold and hard, and it's not clean. But that was the choice, otherwise the, the floor of the cave. And that's how we got the Son of God. What trouble God went to, what trouble Mary went to. But let me say this, Bethlehem was a very small town. There were only 400 families living in Bethlehem when Jesus was born there. Well, when something like a girl riding into town on a donkey and having a baby in a cave by the hotel goes on, why, that's a story in a small town. That's something they remember. And it's very important that they remember it because 30 years later, when an honest seeker like Nicodemus might come to that town and say, I've heard this man preach. They say he's Messiah. I don't want to make a mistake. The prophet Micah said Messiah would be born in your little town. This fellow from Galilee... Can you remember, was he born here? They would say, well, who could forget it? Of course he was born here. We all remember that. And, and someone might say, well, well uh, uh, is he of the tribe of Judah? Well, yes, they came down for the tax uh, collection. They, they had to come to their home precinct. They were both of Judah, Joseph and Mary. Someone might say, well, they say he was born of a virgin. I'd say, well, we can tell you she was a young girl. They weren't married yet. She was a good girl. And there would be a lot of evidence of how to receive the Messiah. So for those reasons, I think God used a woman to bring us the light of the world. And so a woman, after this break, will bring the light to the Passover table. So much of what I've been reading and studying for 20, 30 years as a Christian here in this short time has just come to life. It's real. It's not just something on the pages of a book now. Come with Zola and see the land of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For tour information, write Zola, 12268 Dallas, Texas, 75225. Uh, Jenny Eisenberg of the Messianic Congregation, Baruch Hashem, has uh, consented to help us with the candle lighting. Good 
Tahadonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam Ashikichanu Behe Mitzvotav Vitzivanu Lehot Likmer Shehoyom Tov Amen. Thank you. Well, now that the candles are at the table, that is, the light is with us, the Messiah is here, it's time to start the Passover in earnest. And uh, we begin with the first cup. There will be four cups of wine, each one having a different significance. This one's called the cup of sanctification. Father looks at the table, makes sure everything's in the right place, it's sanctified, everybody uh, listens to the blessing of the wine and sips of that cup. Now, since we're doing this from house to house and village to village for 35 centuries, it might start to vary and things might be put in different places and different things might creep in. Some have. And uh, we have a book to make sure that we know the original. This is the Haggadah. It's a bestseller. It came out during the Exodus. It opens this way because English books open backwards. <laughs> and uh, in here we have uh, directions on how to set the table. Uh, this is a particularly fine old Haggadah, an ancient uh, a masterpiece, in fact. And uh, it tells the prayers and the order of the service, the story of the Exodus, of course, the plagues and everything. And Father looks in there and compares the pictures with the table to know that everything is quite correct. Now, next he does a peculiar ceremony with the unleavened bread. This is called the hiding of the afakomen. That's a Greek word uh, with reference to uh, the Lord. But he takes three of these loaves of unleavened bread, and he takes a special bag which has uh, three compartments. All the things of Passover are very beautiful. Uh, women are very proud of their setup and part of these uh, uh, part of that setup was these linens and cloths. I'm putting one piece of uh, unleavened bread in each compartment just simply to separate them into a stack of three. And, and now that there's a distinct stack of three, Father uh, says the blessing over that bread, and then he removes the middle piece. He breaks it. He wraps it, an improvement since Jesus' time, <laughs> and he hides it away. My father used to put it behind the cushion on his chair. He doesn't explain what he's done, but he'll come back to it later, so we'll go right on. The next thing that happens in the service is the youngest member present asks four questions, four key questions that is going to give the father his cue to tell the Passover story once again. And everybody had a chance at this, the, the, whether a boy or a girl, when you were the youngest child, you asked the four questions. And we have the help this time of Nathan Eisenberg, who will chant the questions for us. Go on, Nathan. Manishana ha laila haze, me ko ha laila, me ko ha laila, shebeho ha laila, anu achi, chame tu matza, chame tu matza, ha laila haze, ha laila haze. Kula matza, halayla haze, halayla haze. Kula matza, shebecho halayla, anu achin. She'a, oh, her year ago. She'a, year ago. Halayla haze, halayla haze. Ma ha la la ha ze ha la la ha ze ma a ro she be ho ha la la i ani wa pilin a filu pa me ha a filu pa me ha ha la la ha ze ha la la ha ze 
Halayla haze, halayla haze, kulanu mesubin. Halayla haze, halayla haze, kulanu mesubin. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Stacy. <laughs> Well, what did he say? Uh, <laughs> basically, how is this night different from all other nights? Well, <laughs> in Egypt, of course, it was the night of a great sacrifice. In the New Testament, it's also a night of a great sacrifice. Uh, this night is different from all other nights because on this night, men are going to kill God. That's, uh, that's what happened. And with that blood of that lamb, the world is truly emancipated like the Jews were taken out in the Exodus. This really is a story of sacrifice and salvation. And the story proves it. Father takes his cue from those questions to explain them. And what did they really mean? Uh, he wants to know why on all other nights we eat any kind of bread, but tonight only unleavened bread. Why the uh, bitter herbs uh, on the table, um, the reclining on cushions on the chair so we can relax. Uh, the dipping, there's a, a bowl of salt water uh, that we're going to dip things in, and there's chorosis. I'm going to come to these things. There's dipping ceremonies. And he asks about all those things, and Father, in answering the questions, tells the story of the Exodus. And when he comes to each of these foods, they pertain to a part of the story. So we stop the story and eat the food and go on to the next thing. He begins, when we were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt. And I, I mean, no other nation can tell a story that's so old, that's so thrilling uh, as, as the emancipation of this entire nation. Uh, he starts with the bitterness of the slavery in Egypt, and here we have a horseradish on this. Uh, there's a lazy Susan with the ceremonial foods on it. And uh, there's a little bit of horseradish on there. You break up a piece of the unleavened bread, <laughs> dip it in the horseradish, and eat that. And uh, well, sometimes they just slice a chip off a real horseradish. That will clear your sinuses. Uh, <laughs> it brings tears to the eyes, and that's the idea, to weep over the slavery in Egypt. Then he comes to the uh, conversation where Pharaoh said, you'll make your own brick mortar from now on, you remember, told Moses. And uh, so they still make it, but they make it of apples, nuts, and cinnamon. It's delicious. The chorosis. I was the chorosis maker in my family. That was my job on the day of preparation. And uh, they uh, dip a piece of bread in that. The dipping uh, in the uh, Middle Eastern ceremony, usually there's, uh, for example, we're going to dip in salt water. There's a laver of salt water in the middle of the table. It's a long table. Uh, in Jesus' time, 12 men at the table. So, so it was either the dipping in the salt water or the dipping in the chorosis where they all get up and reach over. And we, we know this from the gospel because you remember the question, uh, who, which of us will betray you, Lord? And he said at his end of the table, uh, watch for the one that dips after me. Evidently, Judas was at the other end, didn't overhear that. They all get up and dip in this bowl, and Judas' hand was next after the Lord. So we know that they, they did the dipping ceremony. Uh, we come to the shank bone of a lamb, which is on the plate. Uh, this, of course, pertains to the sacrifice uh, I explained. The blood of the lamb, or in the New Testament, the blood of the lamb, <laughs> the same thing. Uh, the uh, second cup of wine comes up during this, and on this one, we actually spill the wine more than uh, drink it. We spill drops when uh, Father chants the names of the plagues. Dom, blood, Svardea, frogs, kinim, vermin, arove, noxious beasts. And, and, and this red wine is falling in a white plate and it, it looks like blood. And, and that is the idea. So um, the last one, Mekat Bir Charot, the, the death of the firstborn. It's a very sad ceremony, the spilling of, of this cup of wine. The parsley is dipped twice in the laver of salt water, once for Israel, young and green in the springtime of its nationhood, 
and once for the army of Egypt that tried to follow him and down the hatch. <laughs> and the story goes on with father uh, uh, telling it, singing, chanting in Hebrew, and everybody following. That's something that uh, we should uh, make a point of, that uh, a Haggadah is it's published in Russia, it's published in China, it's published the world around. And when an immigrant comes here, he can do Passover perfectly. He has a Haggadah in Hebrew. I have a Haggadah in Hebrew. We sit down at this table. It's one of the only things that, that immigrants can do perfectly in America or any other country, this age-old international festival. Well, tune in next week. We'll continue from exactly this point, finish this Seder plate and the story of the Exodus, this wonderful 3,500-year-old festival called Passover. Well, that's the first half of Passover. Tune in next week to see uh, the grand conclusion. You know, Passover is, is the most important of all Bible studies. I really think so. It's the first feast that God gave Moses on Mount Sinai. It's one of the oldest uh, festivals of the whole world, uh, no question, and precious to all peoples. After all, the emancipation of a, an entire people in a single night must be inspiring to everyone. Well, you can study further about this. Uh, uh, the book is $5. We have uh, the cassette, if you like to study with an audio tape, that's $6. The video of this program and the one next week, uh, the whole thing, the two uh, programs, $29. And uh, you'll master this. Uh, it's wonderful to know these things. It really is. It's a witness to your Jewish friends. It's a preparation for the kingdom to come, where we will do Passover, as I said in our lesson. And uh, it's just a very, very good thing to know. You know, when we first went on television, I made sure to get this particular program on. When we first started to go, I, I didn't know if we'd last, so I made sure to get Passover. Well, it's 20 years. We've, we've made it several times over the years. Appreciate your watching. And Sha'alu Shalom Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem.